ahead. Okay, well, sorry I can't be with you there. Uh, I will be staring at a screen. I hope you can uh, find some way to let me know if you're in misery over what I'm telling you. Um, so I've been assigned the task of talking about elasticity and topological mechanics. Uh, mostly I'm going to be reviewing things that uh, physicists should know and most don't know about elasticity and you know, talk about some of the most recent stuff in topological mechanics, uh, but there are lots of people who will be talking along those lines. Um, so what the, the outline of the course is more or less the following. I'll spend probably the rest of today on classical mechanics and related topics, talk about elastic waves and response and elastic medium, and then lattice models, which uh, you know, we'll have a classical uh, long wavelength uh, elastic limit and some other things. And once we've gone through that, we'll have enough of the uh, background to begin to attack the uh, eventually the lattices that have the topological behavior. So then we'll do this, uh, what we call marginally coordinated lattices or the Maxwell lattices, which uh, for which the Maxwell Kaledine theorem is of great importance. Uh, so those those four things in the beginning will set the stage for the later ones. The Kagame lattice will be used as an entry into the various subtleties that, that one needs to understand before going to the topological lattices. I don't know quite how much time um, these lectures are going to take. The last time I gave one of these um, Zoom lectures, I found that uh, there was nothing in the audience to sort of slow down the pace because I couldn't see the audience. So, uh, you know, I, I could have misjudged this by a factor of two. So if, if, if so, we will probably skip the one dimensional topological lattices, which actually do provide a nice entry into the more complex things. And hopefully at the end, I'll have some time to look at mechanical graphene, which uh, actually brings the uh, honeycomb lattice into the game. Uh, with a model, it actually replicates some of the stuff that's going on in the, in the quantum literature. So uh, I have provided you with a, uh, or, or you will be provided with a sort of 80 page uh, write up of the sort of things that are in this. Uh, there is still some misprints and so forth in that. So you may get an update in the, uh, the notes that I prepared at some point as we go along. And, and the notes have the, uh, relevant references, mostly the references, most of this work is taken from my work and from review articles that I've written with others. Okay, so classical Lagrangian elasticity. This is really just uh, continuum mechanics of deformable elastic medium. So a lot of what, what you hear uh, has to do with continuum mechanics, uh, but, but it has real world uh, representatives. So we're gonna start by talking about um, you know, how we describe elastic materials. <laughs> and the starting point is what we'll call a reference space. This is the set of points which get mapped into distorted media. I mean, you can look at this little semi-cartoon below. The, the uh, reference space is the yellow thing on the left with the points X and X prime. And then we take a, uh, uh, we distort the lattice changing the points X to the points R of X. So, and, and or you can think about the displacement U of X, which is the dis displacement relative to the other. But we're going to think about this as being really two distinct spaces for, for some reasons which will become more apparent. So the starting point, the, the unstretched piece of material, whatever it is, will be our um, reference space. That is the space that you know has all of the initial points, and it's not the same as the um, target space. The target space is really uh, the Euclidean space that we live in, and it has the you know the continuous invariants that go with it. Whereas the reference space, you know, can be a crystal, for example, or it can be a quasi-crystal, or it can be a, a random piece of glass. Uh, but Along with that comes different, uh, you know, spatially varying properties, uh, discrete symmetries and things like that. And at least in the beginning of these lectures, we'll distinguish between the, the reference space and the target space. So uh, you can see how that goes. We have 
the mapping between the um, two spaces is, is defined by this equation, R of X equals X plus U of X. Um, uniform translations then are described by U of X is simply some X naught that has moved X relative to, to its original position, or maybe it should be the other way around. In the, in the target space, however, we can uh, have the Euclidean invariances, which include uniform rotations and uniform translations. And you see here, I've written the rotation matrix as the subscript script I, that's the subscript for the uh, target uh, uh, target uh, space and the alpha, the Greek letters will be for the uh, for the reference space. And UI then uh, can have you know this kind of, of behavior which uh, is basically a rotation minus the original state. So the, what we're, when we talk about the uh, elastic media, we're really talking about deforming some original state, the, the uh, reference state. And uh, the, the simplest way to go about that is to say that there is a tensor lambda. I'll, I'll try to use the notation with a tilde over it to in, indicate the actual tensor and uh, in, subscripts will be you know the components of the tensor. So we wanna talk about um, R of X uh, is some tensor lambda I alpha operating on the reference space. Uh, this is the deformation tensor. It's not the strain tensor. Often they're confused. The strain tensor is manifestly uh, uh, even under interchange of indices, whereas the, um, the deformation actually has indices corresponding to the two spaces. The alpha is the reference space and the I is the target space. Now, if we look at the distance between two points in the target space, uh, which are the image of the distance between two initial points in the reference space, then we can relate the um, relationship between R and X to a stress tensor. So here we have two points which are close together in the reference split space, a distance uh, delta X alpha apart. So that's just the distance, um, or well, it's, it's related to distance. And then we extract from that delta R of X. And you can see now that we have the same equation here, delta R of X is equal to a tensor times delta X of X. That's the same equation as the lambda I alpha. And from that, we obtain that uh, lambda I alpha can be defined as a spatially varying tensor, whereas up here, when you write it like this, you tend to think of it as being a uh, you know, uniform distortion of the sample. Uh, so lambda I alpha is dRi dx alpha, which I'll often denote by the derivative d alpha Ri, is a delta I alpha plus eta I alpha, and eta I alpha is the derivative with respect to the um, reference space coordinates of the target space use of I. And of course, if we want to look at volume changes, then the, the volume element d to the dr is just the determinant of the deformation matrix multiplying d to the dx. So the simplest uh, distortion that one can think of is a compressional or expansion deformation, an isotropic one, which gives you the ratio of v over v naught from the, from the Jacobian equation we just showed uh, v over v naught is the determinant of lambda, which is lambda to the d if you have a uniform compression or distortion. So denoted crudely over here, the outer box is before you compress and the inner box is after it. And uh, you can induce this sort of transformation by a pressure, for example. The other two deformations that you typically see are that of pure shear. Pure shear involves Let's see here. Can you see me if I do that? Yeah, okay. So, you know, you just grab a uh, cylinder of wood or something and you pull on it. You stretch in the distance that you pull and your normal expectation is that you will, um, you know, ha have a, a diminishment in the radii or the distances in the other direction because most of the materials we deal with have a very large uh, compression modulus. 
which means that it's very hard to change the volume, but you might be able to change uh, the other directions more easily. <clears throat> the other simple shear deformation is the simple shear. It is uh, described by taking uh, one side of your sample, clamping it, and then shearing it by pulling the top, and you go from the square here to the darker uh, parallelogram, uh, which now looks like it has an angle theta one with respect to the z-axis. So once you've got these distortions, you're perfectly free to take the, the distorted material and move it around in the reference space. So you can go from A to B here. All of the information about the distortion of the lattice is contained in the uh, uh, parallelogram. And as I said, you can move it all around. That's described by the uh, invariance of the uh, Euclidean space. Uh, this is just a cartoon you can look at. It's, I mean, in, in the one dimensional case, it is worth thinking about what happens in one dimension. If you start off with a bunch of springs uh, connecting masses and you pull on it, what happens is that you have a new length L prime, which is L plus delta L, and it's the number of uh, the, the number of springs that you have uh, times the new distance. So you can see that this sort of distortion is precisely what the deformation tensor describes if it were applied just to one dimension. Okay, now let's talk about the strain or the metric tensor. Distances between two points are, you know, the the uh, rotationally invariant distance, this is a scalar, is dx alpha dx alpha, and you take the square root of it to get the distance. The same is true for r, you have the dot product of dr with dr, and we can now relate dr squared to dx squared. So dr, as you'll recall, is lambda i alpha or i beta times dx beta, right? And then you can take the transpose of it, and the dr squared is lambda transpose lambda, where you're tracing over the target space variables uh, and you come up with a tensor in the reference space, G alpha beta. And this should be familiar to most of you as being the metric tensor for the, uh, the, the material you're looking at. So G alpha beta is D alpha R, D alpha Ri, D beta Ri, or G tilde in uh, the matrix notation is lambda transpose, lambda transpose. Now notice in the middle here, we have this uh, uh, trace over the target space variables, and you can rotate those completely independent of what happens to the alphas. This thing will be invariant to that rotation. Um, the stress tensor that we usually use now, this is the Lagrangian stress tensor, is a half G minus one, so that, uh, I guess I didn't write it here, uh, G is equal to one plus two U. And so you can then expand G out as lambda T lambda. And when you subtract the one, the U in a linearized limit is the eta tilde plus eta tilde transpose. That's the D alpha U beta D beta U alpha. Uh, so U alpha beta with that construction has what we often think of as being the strain it is the linearized strain, the d alpha u beta d beta u alpha part. But there is this other part, d alpha d beta u k u k. So that means that the, the, the real stress to, uh, strain tensor that, that we talk about physically is a nonlinear, necessarily a nonlinear tensor. And this extra part here is what guarantees the uh, rotational invariance of the, of the system. So if you start off with g alpha beta, you can rotate the r's. And over here, when you put this in there and remember the delta function, uh, this term you know, right here gives you the nonlinear corrections that are needed to allow you to talk about rotations that are uh, you know, greater than, with, with angles greater than the, uh, the small angle limit here. So G and U are tensors in the reference space, and they are invariant with respect to rotations in the target space. So we want to talk about now the longitudinal and shear strains. We talked about the, the velocity. I mean, the velocity. V is always velocity, isn't it? <laughs> no, uh, the, the change in the, the volume ratio, V to V naught, is the determinant of lambda. So delta V 
over V naught is the determinant of lambda, lambda, which I can write as the determinant of lambda transpose lambda transpose to the one half power. Um, so that gives you that the determinant that this volume change is proportional to the uh, or is the determinant of the stress tensor. You can then write that stress tensor is one plus two u, as we talked about, with a square root minus one. And what comes out is that this determinant to linear order is the divergence of u, where of course the derivative is taken with respect to the uh, reference space. So the tra strain tensor by construction here has d times d plus one over two degrees of freedom. So there are three independent strains in, should be, this should be a two here, in, in two dimensions and six in three dimensions, one of which is the uh, trace of u. So there are d squared plus d minus two over two shear degrees of freedom or strain that describe, describe the uh, elasticity of uh, whichever system you want to talk about. So now we want to go on to the energies. So the elastic energy clearly depends on the deformation tensor, but it is invariant under the uniform rotations in the uh, target space, and it's invariant under the symmetry operations of the reference space. So that implies that if we say the elastic energy is a function of the distortion, which we can do, then we have a energy at the elastic, which depends on lambda, and it's invariant under invariances of the reference space, that's V, and invariances of the target space. Now, we've discussed that the target space really just involves, it's mostly post-distortion rotations and displacements of the system. So we can take this and say, well, I really would rather uh, not have to worry about two different spaces at once. Let's say that this is a, a function of lambda transpose lambda, and so the lambda transpose lambda, you know, as, as we saw, it has in it a trace over the target space variables, which means that uh, we can rotate in any way we want and do any invariance we want in the uh, target space, and that won't change the, the answer. So we might as well just go on and talk about the stress tensor, I mean, I mean the strain tensor. So that means we can write the total energy as an energy over an energy as an integral over an energy density, which is now a function of, if we wish, lambda transpose lambda, but really we're interested in the deviations, so we'll choose to express the energy in terms of the symmetric strain tensor, where f elastic is now f elastic of u, and it is still invariant under the discrete groups of the reference space. So most of what we're going to do, and there's a lot in it already, is to look at the energy that's quadratic in U. So that requires a fourth rank tensor that couples to the uh, product of the two second rank tensors. Um, so we can immediately talk about the symmetries that this must have. It's the K alpha beta gamma, the elastic matrix, um, is symmetric under interchange of alpha and beta because U is invariant under the alpha and beta, and it's invariant under gamma delta, under interchange of gamma and delta, and it's invariant under the interchange of alpha, beta, and gamma delta to together. That's because these two things are symmetric, are, you know, can be interchanged. So we have K alpha, beta, gamma, delta is K gamma, delta, alpha, beta. That's interchanging alpha, beta, and gamma, delta. It's in equal to K beta, gamma, alpha. That's interchanging the alpha and the beta here and it's equal to K alpha beta delta gamma and all com combinations of those. Um, we often will talk about the uh, isotropic system. Uh, here, you have a scalar, uh, rather a tensor that has to depend upon tensors that describe the uh, um, reference state. And since we don't have anything that's chiral in here, we, we, we can't use the alpha, epsilon alpha beta gamma. So the only tensor at your disposal to construct an elastic tensor are the delta functions. And so you can write it in terms of the two Lamé coefficients, the lambda and the mu, lambda delta alpha beta, lambda gamma delta, and then plus the symmetrized version of the other one. So this is a form that is often used 
In the engineering literature, you'll find more that you'll use the bulk modulus and something called the Young's modulus, which we'll talk about shortly. The, um, the elastic energy with the lambda, this term gives you that the two expo the two indices in the U are the same, so that's the trace over U. And this part we can combine with something from this and have the elastic energy to depend upon the trace, which is the change in the volume, plus the symmetric traceless tensor part, which is all shear. So mu is the shear modulus, and B, which is lambda plus two mu over D, is the bulk modulus. Now, we're going to be doing a lot of two-dimensional physics. So mu uh, D is equal to two, so B is equal to lambda plus mu, and B goes to zero when lambda is equal to minus mu, or the other way around. Um, Right, okay, so in the isotropic system, we just have two Lame coefficients. Um, but, you know, we can construct something uh, more complex. So here's an example of uh, the elastic tensor for a system that has cylindrical symmetry. So a material that has, at the quadratic level, uh, cylindrical symmetry is a stack of, uh, of uh, Shoot, what are they? The the uh, benzene, not benzene. Shoot, the the uh, graphene. A stacks of graphene. Graphene has hexagonal symmetry, which up to quadratic order in the strains is is the same as an isotropic system. So this would be a um, elastic constant tensor for the something like a stack of uh, of those uh, hexagonal layers. So to do that, we, we say the z direction is along the vector n, and it is invariant under n going to minus n, so you have to have a quadratic in n. Uh, this delta t alpha beta, I didn't write down, is delta alpha beta minus n alpha n beta, and you can see that all of these things satisfy, this construction satisfies the symmetry operations, you know, the interchanges of alpha and beta and beta and gamma, etc. And if you if you then take this in, this elastic constant and plug it into here, you have five elastic constants, and that isn't even the most general uh, form uh, that you could have. Okay, let's see. That's the uniaxial energy. Okay, so um, the, the, there are some subtleties with the, even the simple harmonic elasticity that that really is confusing if you haven't been told about it. So what we what the natural thing to do is to take this tensor, which we construct, uh, you know, more generally construct using the symmetry properties of the uh, reference lattice, and then just, you know, do do what the uh, elastic energy says to do. Take this and multiply times the uh, the strain tensors, and you will then get an energy which depends upon the strain tensors uh, and the various k's here. So the, the most natural way of doing it is what I just said. So let's look at what happens in two dimensions where you have uh, uh, six different elastic constants. One, two, three, four, wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. So, so you have six different ones. And, and, and when you carry out the operation of taking this, trace over the alpha betas and gamma deltas here. Notice that I have the uxy and uyx, both of them appear here, and the same is true for that. And the net effect is that when you look at the energy that comes out, whenever you have an xy, you have a factor of two because of the fact that there's also a yx. So that's fine if you if you know what you're doing and you, and you keep all of these straight, but one of the things that you have grown to expect, especially if you come come from a uh, a background of uh, you know Lagrangian field theories and things like that, you, you want your stress tensor to be the derivative of the free energy with respect to the strains. And if you do that, you get the wrong stress tensor. So there are other notations which are used quite extensively in the engineering literature. 
the Voigt notation being the most, most common of one. Rather than taking the U to be UXX, UYY, and UXZ, so here the, the energy, I, I should have said that, you know, the energy is this three by three tensor multiplied times the, the uh, this pseudo vector or pseudo, uh, you know, different kind of vector. It doesn't transform like a vector, but, but it looks like one when you write it out. Uh, so, but, but you, you carry out the, the uh, calculation of this quantity in the same way as you would if these things were tensors. So that's what the transfer, transverse part here is that, and the uh, untransferred part is the vertical version of it. Uh, so uh, what Voigt says to do, okay, er, since every time I see an XY, there's a factor of two there, I'll just redefine my strain tensor to be UXX, UYY, and two UXY. Then your, uh, th this is called the, uh, the stiffness tensor, this K thing. Uh, so, so, so now you get something where there's no double counting. And as long as you treat the UV as though the, the var variables are UXX, V, UY, Y, V, and UX, Y, V without a two here, then when you calculate the stress tensor and go put the two back in, you do get the right answer. So, uh, you know, both are used. We will see this one more than this one. Okay, <clears throat> now stress. Uh, we're taught that, uh, you know, the stress tensor has to be a symmetric uh, tensor because of uh, angular momentum conservation, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, so, so this is the Cauchy stress in which you look at the force per unit area in the actual space you're living in uh, with a derivative with respect to the actual displacements that you're living in. So, um, you know, you might have a, a piece of material and contort it, and the, the um, Cauchy stress, when you look at the contorted uh, version, you have a normal to the layer, to, to the area right here. The area is measured in terms of the actual area of the material you're looking at, which you know may or may not have been strained from another, uh, well, strained from, from the rest material. And uh, so, so you have now a tensor in the target space. Everything's a tensor in the target space. So now uh, let's look at what the total force on an object is. It's the integral over the, all of the volume, whatever it is, distorted or undistorted, times the energy density, and I put a C here to make it a Cauchy one. So this is integral D3R times the derivative of the stress tensor, which I can integrate to the boundary. And it's, you know, integral DS sigma IJ, uh, SDS IJ. Now I can take the surface outside the material. And remember what we're talking about is the stress tensor that arises from the internal forces in, in the material we're talking about. So it's zero if I on a surface that's outside the material. So we can, we, can, we can put the surface anywhere we want and set it equal to zero. Now you do have the option, which you will see in most uh, literature, most uh, textbooks on elasticity, you have the option of uh, you know, putting the surface in and then worrying about the surface contribution, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, the answer for the, you know, the, the total is this, and it extends over to the, to the uh, angular momentum. So let's apply a torque, which is a force times a distance, right? So the torque on a material is the integral over its volume times the torque, which is the uh, is R cross F. So little F here is remember the energy density and it's the, it's the Cauchy energy density, meaning it's the energy per unit volume of the, of the uh, target space. So we can take this, write it in terms of the stress tensor, the, the, the uh, Lagrangian stress tensor, and then we can integrate by parts. We have a part that comes from the surface, which is again, we placed outside the material. So that part is zero. Then it leaves us with minus integral D3R epsilon IJK sigma KLC. Well, this has to be zero. So to do that, if the, if the um, stress tensor is even under interchange of I, K, and J, then you get zero immediately. So those are the two things that you, that you get from the, the Cauchy. And, and um, 
unlike the elastic theory we're going to be talking about now, you know, some of the standard theories of uh, continuum mechanics uh, actually start with the, uh, you know, typically there you have the, the, what we call the target space, space and space, and then you have fields that are functions of the target space naturally. So, uh, you know, just to keep the record straight, there is another way of describing elasticity, which I don't have time to talk about here, which is based upon the phases of your mass density waves. And that is a situation where the phase of the mass density wave is a function of our actual space. And when you do that, what you see is the, the Cauchy stress tensor. Okay, so what, what happens if you're still going to live in this world where we, we take um, our uh, reference state and map it onto the other state? We still have a change in energy, right? The change in energy done by the material itself. Okay, so this Fi with, with a one up there is the energy density, the energy per unit volume in the reference phase. And um, it is a function of, of X, the reference state. And we then do a displacement in real space delta Ri. Okay, now the Fi, the force itself has the same constraints as before. We, uh, the, in, the integral over the whole force has to be zero. Only now it's an integral over the reference space. So that means that the F itself has to be expressible as, a, as the derivative of a stress tensor. And this becomes then a sigma I alpha with a gradient with respect. To, uh, well, I'm sorry, we, we, we put it in the, the stress tensor, you know, the, the D sigma I alpha DXI. And um, you do the same uh, integration by parts to go to a surface and a bulk integral. Uh, only this time it depends on X, but again, the same, the same argument appears. This part will be zero, and then we have an integral over the reference volume. This um, the first PK stress tensor. It's called the first Piola-Kirchhoff stress tensor. Fi is equal to derivative with respect to the reference state variable of a sigma i alpha. So this thing takes a tensor with a component described in the reference space and converts it into a vector in the uh, target space, but depending on x. So you can see now that this grad alpha delta ri is nothing more than the change in the lambda that takes place from displacing the r. So the change in the free energy is sigma i, sigma 1 i alpha delta lambda i alpha. So this is not what you probably expected if you go to Landau and Lifshitz, you immediately go and see that he goes to the symmetric stress tensor. But your starting point is this uh, uh, force, which is a measurable force in the target space, expressed as a function of the uh, reference space, and you get this. So now the question is, well, uh, if there's nothing wrong with this, can I get and to the stress tensor, to, to the to the Cauchy stress tensor, and we'll derive how that happens here. So the Fi is the functional derivative of this, of this total free energy with respect to the displacement Ui. Uh, that's, that's what the definition generally is, right? That, 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 that it's a definition of a displacement, not, not, a, um, not, not a tensor. So let's observe that if I differentiate the uh, symmetric stress, a strain tensor with respect to the lambda I alpha, I get this symmetrized version, which is a lambda times the delta function. So I can then say that the first PK stress tensor is the derivative with respect to F of the lambda I alpha. That comes right out of this. But F is, we've agreed now that we can express F in terms of U alpha beta without any loss of generality. So we should think of F is being a function of U alpha beta. So the sigma I is a DF, this is the free energy density, D lambda I alpha, which is DF DU alpha beta because F depends on the U and the DU alpha beta uh, derivative with respect to lambda I alpha. Uh, 
So what comes out of that is this part right here is what we're going to call the second piola kirchhoff stress tensor. It has the, the units and form of stress tensor. It's the derivative of the free energy with respect to a symmetric tensor. And so it is symmetric itself. So we then have that the first piola kirchhoff tensor is lambda times the second piola kirchhoff tensor. This is symmetric and uh, this one, this one, this one is not, right? So now we write delta F is sigma two beta alpha times lambda I beta. That's this relationship right here. And we now have a lambda delta lambda. But if I look at, um, let's see, I, I wanna say this. So now if I look at du alpha beta D lambda I alpha, you get that it's lambda with you know the delta functions. And when I take this and multiply it times delta lambda I alpha, I get delta U alpha beta. Because you know delta U alpha beta is equal to this times lambda alpha beta. So now we have that indeed the uh, free energy is has the same form in a sense as the uh, uh, the, the first piola Kirchhoff ten stress tensor. In other words, delta F is delta delta F delta lambda is sigma one. Now we have that we have a by construction by definition a symmetric stress tensor a strain tensor rather the delta U alpha beta multiplying the second piola Kirchhoff stress tensor, which then itself must be symmetric. So this is what uh, people are usually thinking about when they write out what you see in the most physics texts, which limit themselves to uh, the uh, linearized version right here. So now we can go and say that, well, the change in F, I can now go back and re-express in terms of the um, of the target space R's. So how do I do that? I take <coughs> um, this expression. Well, actually, it's it's uh, where where is it now? Which one do I want to use? Uh, I think I'm using this one. So I first convert the x to the r. That gives me one over det determinant lambda tilde. I get the lambda one alpha beta. And then I get the uh, delta lambda I alpha. Uh, so, so I always get, get a little confused exactly how this goes. We can write this, the delta lambda, yeah, here it is. Delta lambda I alpha is delta U I, delta R J, delta R I, delta X alpha. And that gives you then this expression here. You put it all together and you get that the Lambda C is one over the determinant of the first piola Kirchhoff tensor times lambda I alpha. That's all this part. And then you get the part that comes from the, the final transformation, turning this into a lambda. And this is exactly what we had before. So um, I should say that that if, if you look at the literature on uh, uh, polymers and uh, rubbers and so forth, this is derived directly by looking at some volume element, looking at the forces that are transported across the volume element, say by springs between the, the uh, mass sites, uh, and you get the same thing that comes out of it. Uh, right. Okay, now just uh, response in, in uh, isotropic systems. This is just some little bit of background that one should know. So here we're going to work in the uh, linearized limit now. So this U alpha beta is just a grad alpha, uh, grad alpha U beta plus grad beta U alpha over two. So I can calculate the second piola Kirchhoff stress tensor. It's the, it's the elastic modulus times the symmetrized strain. And so for a isotropic system, I can calculate lambda two alpha beta. And again, if we're talking about the linearized theory, uh, this is really the same thing as, as lambda, as a sigma alpha beta, the, the uh, Cauchy one. So that's lambda delta alpha beta gamma u, u. So, so this is the rotationally invariant part. This is the strain part. 
which we can write, as we said before, as the stress the, the bulk modulus times the change in the volume plus the shear modulus times the shears. And recall that the bulk modulus is lambda plus two mu over D. So we can get the response to isotropic pressure, which is the, the alpha alpha part, that's the strain over it, divided by three. So that the stress in all three directions are the same. You take the strain of the stress tensor. I mean, each individual component is minus P. And so you get that the uh, change, the relative volume change is minus P over the bulk modulus. In response to the uniaxial forces, well, you know, there's a little bit of algebra you can do that uh, takes you from this to this, but you can easily apply the, the uniaxial tension and you get that UZZ is proportional to that. It's T over Y, where Y is the Young's modulus, which is 9BU over 3B plus mu, and uh, UX, UY is equal to this. Notice that they're the same as they should be because I'm pulling in one direction, leaving the other two directions the same as, as long as you're talking about an isotropic system. And that UXX is equal, to, is equal to minus sigma UZZ, where sigma is what's called the Poisson ratio. That's the ratio of the amount of compression you get as a function of stretching. And the minus sign is important here. Now, most materials, as I've said, that we look at have a bulk modulus, which is substantially larger than the bulk. You know, in iron and things like that, they're the same order of magnitude, but there's a factor of five or six difference sometimes between the bulk modulus and, and the shear modulus. Um, if I set the bulk modulus to zero, the uh, Y goes to infinity. No, I'm sorry, the bulk modulus goes to zero. I'm sorry, yeah, the, it, it, the Y goes to zero and the ZZ displacement goes to infinity and the XY displacement goes to zero. Um, now notice that if B gets to be small instead of large, as is the case in some of the lattices we'll look at, then sigma itself becomes negative, which means that when I pull like this, the thing opens like that. So this is a very strange thing. And you know, the closest we come at the moment to a real application of that is the cork in a wine bottle. Uh, you know, you want to control the Poisson ratio of the cork because if it if it's a standard-like thing where you pull really hard on the cork, it decreases in size in the opposite direction and pops out of the bottle too easily. So you want something that where the sigma is pretty pretty close to to, to zero. Okay. Okay, th this is a lot of uh, <clears throat> equations. Uh, I'll just try to go through the, the, the gist of it. So it turns out that any square matrix can be written as a rotation matrix times a symmetric matrix or vice versa. So I, I and uh, just to protect myself, I, I'll assume that lambda doesn't have zero entries and so forth. It, it's all a nice variable that can we can deal with. So let's take the stress tensor, the, the deformation tensor lambda. I can always write that as lambda times the square root of, of the uh, metric tensor, well, one over the square root of the metric tensor times the square metric tensor. And then I can say, well, this is O times G. G is a symmetric tensor. And, uh, you know, with the one half, it's still a symmetric tensor. So we can then take what's left over, the lambda times the inverse square root of the uh, metric tensor and see what its properties are. So we'll call this O tilde, knowing that it's going to become a rotation matrix. So this is lambda g to the minus a half. So what are the properties of a rotation matrix? Well, we have to have that OT uh, and O, the product is equal to one or O times OT, is equal to the unit tensor. So let's look at OT. The transverse of O is G to the minus a half lambda transpose. The uh, O itself is lambda transpose lambda G to the minus a half, but that is equal to G times G to the, rather the, the lambda T lambda here is the G and it's uh, greeted on both sides with the G to the minus a half. So it's correctly the unit tensor. Uh, 
I do it the other way around. It's a little more subtle. Uh, you get lambda g to the minus a half lambda g to the minus half transpose, which is lambda g to the minus a half, g to the minus a half lambda transpose, which is this. And I can write that as lambda, lambda transpose, lambda to the minus one, lambda transpose. And the transpose is lambda to the minus one, lambda t to the minus one. This required that the lambda, uh, that the inverse of the lambda exists. And of course, if it does have a lambda inverse, that's what we want. Um, so you can then look at the what it, what O is from this. This is now writing the G. Uh, yeah, this is lambda to tilde G, G to the minus a half. So that's delta plus the eta. And the stress tensor is G plus eta. And then, so I have the transpose times that with a, with a minus a half. And now we can expand to linear uh, order in eta, we get a delta plus an eta minus from this contraption, minus a half eta transpose lambda, which gives me delta plus a half eta minus eta transpose. And we can see then that for small distortions, the rotation matrix is nothing but delta I alpha times the uh, uh, cross product or, or epsilon I, well, it, it, it's the odd combination instead of the even combination of D by du, and this, of course, is the rotation that takes place with an angle k. So, you know, some, sometimes it's useful. For, for example, one thing you don't often see discussed in a, uh, a, a standard elasticity textbook is what do you do when you have a field that you want to, that you know you measure in the ref, in a target space, like the electric field, and you want it to couple to the invariances of the uh, of the uh, reference matrix, so you would think that you could write e alpha u alpha beta e alpha e beta, but that's not well. You, you can sort of you can write it like this, but the e alpha you don't know what that is if you're just making a measurement of the electric field. You have to get e alpha into the basis that is the same as that of the reference uh, uh, space, the reference space. So let's introduce a the spin operator or the rotation operator here and write this as EI, OI alpha, U alpha beta, O transverse beta J, et cetera. So, so what we've got is we now have converted this to a legitimate uh, vector or, or, or scalar in the uh, reference, uh, the target space, in the target space with a V, which is this product that has converted the U to a U, UIJ, basically. And you can calculate what this V is to linear order. And interestingly, to linear order, this V is actually the uh, linearized, symmetrized uh, eta tensor. And that goes back to saying, well, okay, if I'm not going to distinguish between things, I'm just going to keep the harmonic order, then you can call this UIJ, EIJ as, as well if you want. But, but if you really are interested in what happens if you have a material that is soft enough that you can use the electric fields to stretch it, you would need to, to keep straight this kind of thing. Or maybe just do the whole calculation in terms of the lambdas. Okay, now harmonic elasticity. Um, so we're going to restrict ourselves to the harmonic theory for the moment, and we don't really need to distinguish between the reference space and the target space. So now we can write F is a half integral over the, the volume of the uh, undisturbed material, grad J, U, I, epsilon, I, J. So, so the, the way I do things, the I usually, the, the I that appears first here is associated with the uh, stretches in the target space and the J that appears here goes with that one, which is properties of the uh, reference space. And and the, <clears throat> the strain has become, we, we had here the symmetrized strain, but we know that the K is symmetrized. So we've replaced these with a D with, with just the single, the unsymmetrized form because the K symmetrizes for us. Um, more generally, you can imagine a K that depends on X and X prime and you could write it 
like this with a U and a U. Now, of course, the, the minute that I've got, that I transfer these gradient operators to the K, this Kij of XX prime is the, the elastic matrix times an operator that operates on a delta function and one doesn't. So if I take this thing and operate on U, I get, uh, you know, I, I get this, if I go to the Fourier transform, I get a, a Kij of Q, which is a Kijl, the K coupling to the Q and the J and the L coupling to the other Q and the IJ telling me what this is. So this is called, well, the, the this part right here, I think I said that this was called the stiffness matrix. No, this part is the stiffest stiffness matrix. And in an isotropic system, it is lambda plus two mu qi qj plus mu q squared uh, symmetric traceless part. And your energy in terms of the q's is the integral of a q that's associated with the x space ui of minus q kij bar of q uij. I, I put a bar here uh, partially to distinguish it from what happens when we go to the dynamics. But uh, now you see now that we have several different ways of writing the elastic energy, which is particularly simple for the um, case of the linearized theory. Oops. Okay, so now I want to talk about bulk sound waves. So th the first thing to, to notice is that, well, you, you have the equation of motion is that rho uh, u double dot, that's the displacement, so this is the ma part, is equal to the force, and this is the force uh, generated by internal things, so, so the, we, we uh, it actually is this, there's no minus sign here because of that, that effect. So given the form of the k that I showed, k of q I showed you in the last slide, in other words, this form right here, do you see the the uh, pointers moving around at all? Yeah, uh, hi, Tom. Uh, there, there is a question here. Let me sure. press the microphone. Yeah. Where are you? Yes. You did. Oh, sorry, Tom. Can you 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 can continue? Sorry, I trust. You changed your mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come forward. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or you can ask Danilo, he knows all about it. Yeah. Okay, no, you, you really chickened out. Okay. Jim, Tom, Tom. Okay. Uh, let's see, where am I going now? Oops, that's the wrong place. Okay. So notice that the um, what, what goes in here is that the, the Dij, what's called the dynamical matrix, is K divided by rho. I guess I forgot to put a bar there. So rho dij is the same thing we had before, it's kij. And you can immediately see that the problem of finding what the modes are from this equation, which is omega squared ui is dij uj, is that we're going to have a longitudinal mode, which points in the direction of q. E, long, e longitudinal is qx qy. And we have a mode, the transverse mode, which is in the direction of, or transverse modes in the direction of QY, QX. Now, we're in, uh, I, I've represented these longitudinal and transverse for uh, two dimensional matrices. The same form appears for the higher dimensional ones. Um, I was just too lazy to write it out. So you can see pretty clearly that I'm going to have a omega L squared, which is omega squared here. There are two derivatives, or two powers of Q and D, we're going to have omega squared is proportional to Q squared with a sound velocity CL squared. And the CL squared is this coefficient here divided by rho. It's lambda in two dimensions, it's lambda plus two mu over rho. Lambda plus, wait a minute, this is, oh, I see, lambda plus two mu over U, which is B plus, two times d minus one mu over d, okay? So this gives us the longitudinal uh, sound velocity and the transverse sound velocity is simply 
the, the only thing we have there that that's couples to the transverse degrees of freedom is mu is ct squared is mu over rho. Now, one observation I'd like to make here is that the remember that B tells me about what happens when you compress a sample. So imagine you have B equal to zero, then you can compress the sample with no, no force. Uh, so you would think that um, uh, you you would not have a, you would not have enough rigidity in the system to have a sound velocity. So set b equal to zero here, and we still get that um, the uh, the sound velocity. There is a sound velocity which is two d minus one over d times mu. And in two dimensions, d is equal to two, so the mu becomes the same and, and the, the is the same as the transverse. So C T squared is equal to C C L squared in two dimensions when the bulk modulus goes to zero. Now, of course, you can make life complicated for yourself. The Dij of Q is this matrix if we have all of the six independent components that are possible for the uh, you know an arbitrarily uh, an arbitrary symmetry uh, 2Ds crystal, which has the lowest symmetry possible. So we want to keep the, these two things in mind about the bulk modulus at the moment. Now, a subject that often is usually also not taught in undergraduate, even graduate school now, is the Rayleigh surface wave. So I remind you, here is a depiction of a Rayleigh surface wave for an ocean wave this is meant to do, that you have the particles, there's a surface mode where the particles rotate around in these ellipsoidal patch forms all along the system. But what we have is a surface at the top that is connected to a bulk that controls many things. In this case, however, it's we don't have to worry about um, uh, gravity effects or anything like that. The, 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 it's the surface tension and the, uh, well, the, the, the two components of the surface tension that contribute or, or determine this uh, wave. For the, for the ocean case or water, the stress tensor has to be uh, normal to the, to the surface, which is not the case here. So let's start off. We have QX and QY in the bulk. Now we can ask the question, what happens if we change one of them to an imaginary value instead of a real value? So we let QX go to Q. So let's think of QX being equal be the direction along the horizontal direction here, and QY, the uh, value going upward. So let's ask what happens if we let QY go to IKL or IKT. Well, in that case, you get a uh, decaying thing because you know your, your bulk solution was e to the IQ dot X. Did I keep that up there properly? I probably didn't. Uh, okay, so. You know, we're doing the Fourier transform, so it should be e to the iq dot x. So we have e to the iq x, e to the iq y, and q y is minus kappa l or kappa t. And so what we're going to do is to introduce the longitudinal and transverse variables with the with, or directions with the q longitudinal and q transverse uh, change to the kappa part. We still have the the uh, Constraint, however, that in the bulk, we have to have that omega squared is CL squared Q squared for any longitudinal excitation and equal to uh, CT squared times Q squared uh, CT squared. So this is just a re-expression of that with the QY replaced by an IQ, but we need to replace it by a different value for the longitudinal mode and for the transverse mode. So now what we have is that the ux is going to be e to the iqx. We're going to write down the same thing that we would have for the bulk sample, except letting the appropriate q's go to k. So in, in the bulk, we have ux is equal to e to the iq dot x times qal plus, or rather qxal plus qyat. Now, of course, you could have chosen a different normalization and that would have gone away in, in the final analysis. So 
we have a Q that goes with the AL and a K that goes with the KT. Now we have to take that and put it into the stress tensor. So we've we've looked at what the stress tensor is. This is just writing it out again. Here is the remember it's lambda plus two mu sigma x uh, sigma alpha alpha, which is sigma y y plus sigma x x, and then we have the lambda part, which the, this index here has to go with that one. So we have a lambda u y y, and you know using what we know about the sound velocities and everything now we get that the sigma y y is rho c l squared u y y plus c l squared minus c t squared. I think that this was supposed to be a uxx. I apologize. Too much uh, typing today. Uh, sigma xy is then 2 mu 2 uxy, which is 2 rho c t squared. And now we want to look at this at y equals 0. So we get rid of the exponents that would have appeared here and plug everything in, set the sigma xx and sigma xy equal to 0, and you get this equation. Now, this may be of some a concern to you. This is not what you're used to seeing in a eigenvalue problem. You're used to seeing a minus omega squared here and a minus omega squared here. In other words, along the diagonal, so that uh, the omega squared part being along the diagonal, so that you can have an AL AT times a matrix is equal to omega squared over here, omega squared Q squared, and well, omega squared and omega squared here. But here we have the kappa T and the kappa L. They both depend upon uh, omega via the, the uh, equation we had earlier, via this equation. So KL is the square root of this, and KT is the square root of that. So, But once we've got this, we can say, well, the condition for a solution is that the determinant of this equation be equal to zero. So the determinant is this term, q squared plus kappa t squared, cl squared q squared minus kappa l squared minus 2 q squared ct squared. So that's the product of these two. And then we have the product minus the product of these two, which is minus 4 q squared, ct squared, q squared, kl kt. So in order to get the omega squared out, we have to replace the kl squared by an omega squared minus um, c squared uh, c squared q, q at y squared, qx squared rather, et cetera. <clears throat> but now, now we've got a really sort of a mess because we have the square root here. But what you can do is put this over on the right-hand side of the equation, square both sides, and you will have an omega to the fourth squared that comes from here, and the same thing comes from squaring this guy. So we have a an equation uh, for omega uh, an eighth order algebraic equation for omega. Setting omega squared to ct squared, s squared, q squared. So you know, notice all the terms. If you make all the terms depend on q squared here, you get rid of, uh, you know, everything is a scalar. The ct comes out except for these, these two things which come from that guy and that guy. So you look at this and as a function of ct and cl, you can solve for everything. But of course, there are eight solutions there, and uh, that's not good. You know, we only want two solutions or four, depending on how you're counting. Um, and but what we need to do is to constrain kappa t and kappa l squared to be greater than zero. If they're not greater than zero, then the uh, the square root here becomes imaginary, and we're back to the old case. So in order to be in, in a decaying system, we need these things to be greater than zero. And we have to have S squared less than one because the lowest energy bulk mode is C squared, T squared, Q squared, and we don't get any extra surface modes unless we're in a region which is a vacuum basically in terms of the bulk modes. So just to, uh, you know, one could go through the numerics and, uh, you know, plot out something which I didn't get around to do. But there is an interesting limit. Suppose I set lambda b equal to lambda plus mu, and then cl squared becomes equal to ct squared. And we, when you do that, you eliminate this guy, and you eliminate this guy, and you get an equation which we can solve. 
analytically, there is one S equals zero solution that's acceptable. And there's this term with uh, S's and the <clears throat> both of the values of S that come out of this equation are greater than one. So they get rejected. So our two, our solution is S equals zero. And when S is equal to zero, kappa L and kappa T both equal Q. So that means what we have is a decaying mode whose inverse penetration depth is just one over Q. Uh, the penetration depth is one over Q. The inverse penetration depth is one over Q. And notice that we have now a zero value for what would be a dynamical mode if I moved infinitesimally away from, from uh, you know, requiring CTs, CT to equal CL, um, which is what I did to get that. Um, and th that that's really a, a zero mode that exists uh, in the case where the, the B is equal to zero. Okay. One final thing, this isn't so important. I just want to emphasize to you that uh, <coughs> the force is delta F delta U. We can find out what the correlation function is by looking at delta U delta F, which you know is basically the, the inverse of the uh, stiffness function, which gives you a trans transverse and a longitudinal response. You can then turn this into to, uh, the correlation function, and you can from this tell that in two dimensions, you have no long range order in a, in a two dimensional crystal because of the logarithms that come from the one over Q squares coming from the, uh, so, so that's a whole different story, but we've set up the formalism that's needed to get a hold of that. <clears throat> now, one thing that complicates real systems actually considerably is the idea of, is what we call non-affine response. Now, most of the time when you ask, what is the strain uh, produced by a uh, stress tensor, you're thinking that you've applied a uniform strain throughout the sample, and therefore you should get a uniform response to the strain. And that actually isn't true. And you're the, the, the complete elastic moduli of the system are determined by that effect. So if I, I have, for example, a unit cell with 10 atoms in it, okay, and I take the unit cell and I do that. Now, all of the, the uh, atoms on the boundary are constrained to lie on that part because you, you've sort of imposed boundary conditions when you do that, that turnover. Inside, however, all of the, you will have changed the forces on the atoms inside that uh, little quadrangle and they will move all over the place. So here is a depiction of what happens when you have a, a constant elastic constant with a random spatial, <coughs> excuse me, spatially dependent delta K. And what this is, this is the, what, uh, you know, we take a, a delta K, which has a variance, a Gaussian-like variance, and we just, you know, take the equations of motion and uh, uh, take delta K to have a zero average and then calculate the first correction that comes from the, uh, from the variance. And what this picture is, is it shows the direction and some idea of the magnitude of the affine, non-affine displacement of the particles. So this thing was actually distorted like that. <clears throat> and this is representing those changes in the uh, reference state. And notice that, you know, with, with this kind of sort of weak but but uh, widely dispersed uh, randomness, you get all of this behavior, which you need to include when you ask what is the macroscopic uh, elastic constants. So, you know, a fine response is along any, if you have atoms along any straight line here and you do a uh, macroscopic uh, distortion to it, the uh, the not the affine group will have all of the atoms along the same straight line, whereas the non-affine behavior will have things that are moving off the straight line. And you can see how that could happen. If I move this thing over so it looks like this, and the, the old atom sat here, well, it has a somewhat less compression than it did, you know, say, say the interaction between this one and this one is different than it was before because now, rather than being here, I'm up here. Uh, 
And so uh, I think you will hear a lot more about this, particularly uh, um, Fred McIntosh will probably talk about non-affinity. How are we doing here? Okay, <clears throat> so the next subject Tom, is- Tom, we, we do have a question now by Pierre Francesco. Yeah, I have a question now, okay, yes. So uh, what's the distribution of the yes. random part of K? Are we going to the microphone or something? What, what's the distribution of the random part of uh, K in the previous slide? What is the distribution? Yes, of the okay. random part, the, per the perturbation that you do on, on K. So you take uh, uh, delta K to be, uh, I don't know, some power O with, uh, with X minus Y or something like that, or it's short ranged? So, uh, you know, the calculations are done in two dimensions. Um, okay, I can, if you want, I can take one minute and pull the paper up and, and tell you what the answer was. Um, I'll do an escape and I will uh, go to here. I think I left open. I hope I left it open. Shoot, maybe I didn't. Oh, uh, unfortunately, I, I closed it. So let me just see if I can get it from here. Uh, let's go to, let me clear the search, go to, shoot. So you're, you're asking about the angular correlations? Yeah, I mean, just the, the statistical properties. What, what do you put? So we calculated lots of correlation functions for this particular model. Uh, yeah, so I can look at things like, this is two dimensions. What is u prime of x minus u prime of zero squared? In two dimensions, it goes like log x, so like log of x. In three dimensions, it dies off as one over x. For example, okay. is that the sort of thing you were interested in? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I don't know if it, if it's interesting to you. I can send a uh, I can send you the uh, reference. It, it's a FizRev E. Or oh, actually, I can give it to you right now if you want. And you, do you have something to write with? It's PRE 72, page 1, 2005. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Yeah, okay. So we're getting close to the end of time. Is it 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock we stop. So. I'll just tell you what we're doing next, and uh, tomorrow you can get excited about it or not, as you please. Um, so <clears throat> it, it's a lot of interesting things that go on can, can be treated by viewing your elastic medium as a uh, lattice of points connected by springs. And uh, it's, it's particularly nice to deal with the central forces. So this is for, this isn't a, a theory for metals where you have to worry about the electrons and all of that, uh, but we'll see there are a lot of amusing things we can do with uh, with lattices. So- um, Tom, can you, can you hit that full screen mode? Just oh, so. I'm sorry, okay. No, no worries, uh, full, thank you. Full, full screen is, just a second, I wanna go to slideshow. Oops, slideshow is there and I wanna, play from the current slide. There we go. Is that better? Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, so we wanna consider uh, central forces, um, you know, so 612 or whatever you want. Uh, we have, we're gonna label the, the lattice sites by this, the script L, can you see that there in the red box? And there's a, there's a rest length uh, between two sites. So, so th th this are, these are lattice positions in each, um, lattice has a rest position or, or an equilibrium position and a displacement from that. Um, so bonds have an equilibrium length and excited length. So, so the equilibrium, RB0, I'll call it, 
is uh, of a bond that connects L prime to L. It's just the magnitude of RL uh, minus RL prime. And RB, the uh, non-relaxed, uh, um, the non-equilibrium distortion of R is just RL prime minus RL. And delta UPB is UL prime minus UL. And so we have bonds connecting sites have a potential energy VB, that's for the particular bond RB, and our energy is just going to be uh, the sum over the bonds of the bond energies, or we can sum over sites of the bond L prime L, with, but they all depend on the magnitude of RL minus RL prime, and the system should be invariant under uniform rotations. Now, one of the things we'd like to do is uh, develop from the lattice model a full nonlinear model. In other words, I want to take these lattice models and make sure that when I go to the continuum limit, that I get something that depends upon the nonlinear strain tensor, not the simple linear strain tensor, which requires a little bit of manipulation, but it's kind of cute, actually. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing the next time, is to go through all of these things with the, with the um, lattices, and eventually we will end up <coughs> Uh, with with the language we need to talk about lattices, these Maxwell lattices that have the uh, topological uh, properties to them. Okay, I, I think I'll have to restart next time anyway. So so why don't we start here next time? We have we should have had a ten minute break in the middle, shouldn't we have? Are you all getting tired of sitting? Oh, okay, thank you, Tom, very much for the talk and yeah. for the lecture. And uh, let's thank Tom. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? See you tomorrow then. Uh, uh, Tom, if you can wait or just for... Let, let me ask questions. you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me just ask if there, there are any questions now. Comments. Uh, uh, Politics. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like there aren't. Uh, so we'll, yeah. we'll see you tomorrow, Tom. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>